Good afternoon. Uh, Matt, you ready? I don't have anything to start with. So, so okay. uh, um, well, first, before we get into Israel and, um, uh, and Iran and also Lebanon, I, I just want to do the daily flight update. Sure, on flights from Lebanon. So yeah. since I last was here yesterday afternoon, uh, we had one flight go last night from Beirut to uh, Istanbul. There's another flight that left this morning from Beirut to, uh, in route to Istanbul. These are the U.S. organized flights I've mentioned before. Um, uh, total of 50 people on the flight uh, this morning. Uh, so a very small number on the flight last night. I think it was around 13, 14, somewhere around there. Um, to bring the total number of American citizens, legal permanent residents, and their family members who have left on these U.S. organized flights since we started them about a week ago to uh, over 1,100 people. Um, there have been a total of 3,620 available seats on those flights, and then when you add the number of seats uh, on commercial flights that are, we have been making available, there have been a total of 4,600 seats that we have been able to make available to American citizens, permanent residents, and family members. Um, so, the demand does not, 13 or 14 people on a flight, on a plane that carries 300 passengers does not seem like there's a, a significant demand. Also, 50 people on a, you know, on a flight that carries 300 people also does not. So, one, is there any consideration that right now of, of, of pulling these flights down because there's just not enough demand? And secondly, how much has it cost the U.S. government, the taxpayers, to uh, organize these flights? Yeah, so I don't have the cost. Um, I can tell you, obviously, the, there's, there are two ways to look at it. One is the cost of the, the flight itself. I don't have the cost. Uh, and the number of passengers that ride on the plane would impact the net cost to the federal government. But I don't know the, the, the total number okay. for the cost of the plane to, to do I, that kind of subtraction. Okay. If, if um, someone could look into that. Sure. That but then with respect to the, the broader question, so we're going to continue the flights for the time being because we do assess that there is demand. Obviously, we've had more turnout for some flights than others. We've had some flights go out with around 150 people, and then we've had these other flights with, with fewer. But it is going to be an ongoing question we look at, an ongoing assessment that we make. It also partly depends on the number of seats that are available on commercial airlines and whether those flights continue to, uh, to take place. I'll just say we believe we have a duty to do everything we can to help American citizens get out of the country. Um, we have been urging American citizens to leave the country for months, and we know that a lot of people wanted to leave, especially over the past couple weeks. We've had people reach out to us and say that they wanted to leave, and then some of them say that and then don't ultimately leave for maybe very good reasons, which is they're worried about their family members or they have other considerations. But ultimately, we can't make people leave, of course. We can make these options available, and we're going to continue to make them available because the safety and security of American citizens is our uh, top priority. Okay. Um, now on to uh, de uh, on to the other, uh, the more substantive uh, issue of possible Israeli retaliation against um, Iran and also what they're planning on doing in, in Lebanon. Um, was the secretary able to join from the plane? Was he able to he join the he call? The, the call the, between uh, President between Biden president and Prime Minister and, Netanyahu, he did yeah. join from the plane on his way to Laos. Okay. And? And I will defer to, as, as always, when it comes to a call involving the President of the United States, I will defer to the White House to speak to the contents of the call. Well, okay. That's I'm, sure they'll, I'm, sure they'll have a, I'm sure they'll have a readout coming, and of course they have a press briefing, but I'm, I'm not Yeah, but has your, <clears throat> from, from, from this building's perspective, has, has anything, excuse me, has anything changed since, uh, since the call concluded? Um, I don't want to speak to the the call at all. I know the White House will have a readout coming, and I'm sure they'll speak to it. I'm their sure it will be incredibly but, detailed. Uh, 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 I will defer to them on the <coughs> level of detail, and according, oh, defer to you on your assessment of how detailed right. that actually is. Thanks. Yeah, I was wondering. You said you, you, your duty is to do everything you can to uh, help people to leave uh, Lebanon. One of the options would be calling for a ceasefire. But you don't, obviously. And uh, yesterday you said, uh, clearly, uh, said this a couple of days, that you support Israeli incursions against Hezbollah in Lebanon. 
but at the same time, you support ultimately a, a diplomatic solution to, to this. So how do you square that exactly in concrete terms? How do you square supporting escalation and at the same time thinking that that might lead to a diplomatic solution? So we have always been very clear that the diplomatic resolution that we want to see is the full implementation of United Nations Security Council Resolution 1701. That has been our priority, and it's what you've heard from the United States going back to the immediate days after October 7th when Hezbollah began launching rocket attacks against Israel. Um, we ultimately do want to get to a ceasefire, and we do want to get to a diplomatic resolution, and we want to get to a diplomatic resolution that includes Hezbollah finally, after 18 years, fully complying with what that Security Council resolution called on them to do. And those are things that they have not done over the past 18 years since 1701 was adopted. Setting down their arms, withdrawing to uh, north of the Latani River, and it is their refusal to comply with that Security Council resolution that has gotten uh, us to the, the place that we are today. So, yes, we do see um, uh, Israel having the right to conduct these limited incursions to degrade Hezbollah's capability, to delay, degrade its infrastructure, um, to uh, inflict losses in terms of the number of militants that it has available to fight against Israel and to, to launch terrorist attacks on civilians, and uh, ultimately to weaken Hezbollah. And we would like to see the outcome of that being Hezbollah, be Hezbollah finally agreeing to do what it said it would do 18 years ago. Yeah, Simon. Um, yeah, just on the 1701 point, but the, so you're calling for, you're, you're now, I think in the last sort of two weeks, you've, you've started using 1701 uh, talk, as, a, as a sort of re repeated talking point, but in the actual three week ceasefire that you were proposing two weeks ago, uh, that was a, sort of a temporary ceasefire that would hopefully lead to a, a resolution, but no longer do you want uh, an immediate cessation of, of violence to move to a diplomatic. We do, want, we do want to ultimately get to a ceasefire. As I said, we ultimately want to get to a diplomatic uh, resolution. The situation on the ground has changed from where we are two weeks ago, and we hope that this change in situation on the ground will change Hezbollah's calculation, ultimately, because even when um, we were putting forward that ceasefire proposal and trying to get to the full implementation of 1701. Uh, I can tell you there were a lot of people, and you see, you see people publicly commenting on this, quite skeptical of whether Hezbollah, even at the end of a 21-day ceasefire, was going to fully agree to go back to the Latani River, given the fact that they have refused to do that for the past 18 years. Maybe their calculation will be different in the days and weeks ahead. That's the proposition that will be tested. Right, but now... Uh, there's a there, there are, there's a ground incursion, so the Israelis are also in breach of of what would need to happen to, to be in that. So, are they willing to 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 move back over the border if in the in the in the event of a temporary cessation of of fighting, not necessarily going all the way to the the terms of 1701, but what you were calling for before. It seems that you're, so you're no longer calling for that. Right? So the Israeli government will have to speak to what they will and uh, are not willing to do. But to be clear, when we say that we want to see 1701 implemented, that includes all the provisions of 1701. It doesn't just mean the provisions that apply to Hezbollah. It means Israel withdrawing south of the blue line as well. We want to see uh, every provision implemented, and that, include, that includes the provisions, as I just said, for Israel. And yesterday we spoke a bit about this uh, on the back of this video that Prime Minister Netanyahu put out, where he's, you know, he's basically calling for Lebanese people to uh, to rid their country of the the scourge of Hezbollah. So you seem to be backing this campaign. That's the Prime Minister of Israel talking about these these broader aims. Uh, you su you've come out in support of this campaign, but you seem to be basically supporting. The, the, an effort to change the politics of Lebanon by force. So we want the Lebanese people to decide who their leaders ought to be. Bottom line, and that has been our position that continues to be positioned. We don't want to see any other government right. in the region dictate to the people of Lebanon who their leader is. We certainly don't want to dictate to the people of Lebanon who their leader is, and we're not going to. We want the Lebanese people to be able to do it, but we want them to be able to do it absent 
a terrorist organization putting a gun to their head, which is the situation that Lebanon has been in for decades now. Right. And so um, uh, we are hopeful that the stalemate that has existed in Lebanese politics for some time, that for the past two years has kept them from electing a president, because of Hezbollah's influence, because the way Hezbollah uses force to um, uh, make its influence known by threat inside Lebanese politics. Um, we hope that the Lebanese, Lebanese political system can break that deadlock, and ultimately we hope that Hezbollah is degraded enough that they um, uh, are less of a force in Lebanese politics and that they agree to uh, withdraw back up above the Latani River so 1701 can be implemented. Right, but whether you like it or not, Hezbollah is part of the Lebanese political landscape, right? So you are, you're, you're trying, you're, what the Israelis are doing is trying to change that landscape through, through force, and you're supporting that. So this seems to be a very different approach to uh, calling for restraint, trying to get everyone on board with diplomatic uh, agreements. In the last two weeks, we've gone from that to, oh, maybe we could change the government of Lebanon through uh, a ground invasion. So we have always, always made clear that we think a terrorist organization should play no role in the government of any country, and especially a terrorist organization that has shown over decades that it is willing to use force and threaten force against the Lebanese people to accomplish its aims and to hold the people of Lebanon hostage. That is not a new position of the United States. That has been our position going back decades. It will always be our position that Hezbollah should not be able to or should not be allowed to use force against the Lebanese people to accomplish political aims. That hasn't changed. It's not going to change. And, and now, now these sort of broader aims raises a question. Um, you know, you are, what you've come out in support of are limited, uh, I guess, short-term incursions. You won't say uh, how short-term, but but how long can you uh, can this this operation continue with the goal of of uh, basically ridding Lebanese politics of Hezbollah? So we are in conversation with the Israeli government about uh, exactly those questions. Um, the goal that Israel is trying to accomplish is to push them back be, you know, uh, uh, away from the border. I, I, I think is it's a separate, goal, I think, what's that? But, I mean, is I that mean, the goal? Back. They seem to have that goal and other goals. That, that is their goal. I will say it is our goal to ultimately see the Lebanese people elect a, uh, their own political representatives. When it comes to Israel's military goals, I'm not gonna make any forecasts. We're gonna continue to have conversations with them about it. Do, do you believe that Israel's <laughs> military operations um, are being effective in such that they are bringing Lebanon closer to the place where it could politically rid its political system of Hezbollah? I wouldn't want to make any type of assessment today. We have seen so far on the ground limited ground incursions. Um, but as you heard me say previous times at this podium, we are also cognizant of the long history of Israel starting with limited <coughs> ground operations in Lebanon, turning those into full scale, more full-scale ground operations, turning those into occupation, something that we are very clear we're opposed to, we're against. And so we're going to continue to have the conversations with the government of Israel about that because uh, I think it's quite obvious that there is a point at which what they're doing now turns into something different, and that has obviously obvious political effects inside Lebanon, as well as humanitarian effects on the Lebanese people. And what is the U.S. definition of limited incursions? So what we have seen to date have been limited ground incursions, which is, the, which is, the, which is the, the Israeli troops going um, a short distance across the border, conducting operations, not pushing deep inside Lebanon. I, I, I'm not going to offer a, an expansive definition other, other than to say, we will watch what they're doing and make assessments um, based on the facts on the ground. But limited um, refers to the amount of land that they are going into in Lebanon, not the number of troops that they are deploying. Yes, at this point, it's the, it's the amount of land. And so, and that's a great question because um, I think there was public reporting over the past few days that they were deploying <coughs> additional troops to Lebanon. If you look at what they were doing, they were deploying additional troops to widen their operations across a longer stretch of the border, not to deepen their push inside Lebanon. And those are two obviously very different things. Just one quick question. Um, we're seeing Israel's military operations in Gaza ramp up again this week. Does the U.S. support these renewed military operations in Gaza that are being conducted? We will always support their right to go after 
terrorist organizations. And that, in course, of course, includes Hamas, and that includes Hamas in Gaza. But we continue to have concerns that without a political plan, a, pl a, a, a plan for the day after in Gaza that includes a political path for the Palestinian people to realize their legitimate hopes and dreams and aspirations, Israel is going to be bogged down conducting these types of operations for some time to come um, with obviously obvious terrible humanitarian effects for the Palestinian people and with real s security problems for the Israeli people as well. Um, we do not think a plan to just continue conducting operations in Gaza in perpetuity is one that either benefits the Palestinian people or secures long, Israel's long-term interests. But do you see any indication that that isn't their plan as of now? So we continue, we're in conversation with them. We would like to get back to the point of getting to a ceasefire, which would set the stages for an end to the war and would help answer this question about what the future looks like and what the day after looks like for uh, the situation in Gaza. As I've said, over the past few weeks, Sinwar has been unwilling to engage in any meaningful way in the, in the ceasefire talks. I think it is probably reasonable to conclude he's watching what's happening in the north. He's watching Iran's attacks um, uh, against Israel and looking and thinking maybe he's about to get what he's always wanted, which is a full-scale regional war, and that may have changed his calculation. Um, but either way, he ought to return to the talks because it is manifestly in the interest of the Palestinian people to get to a ceasefire in Gaza. And just one more question on Gaza, if you don't mind responding to the reports of Palestinians being shot as they were fleeing northern Gaza. Uh, so we have seen those reports. I can't speak to the details of them, but obviously that would be unacceptable. If they were Palestinian civilians that were fleeing, that were, uh, uh, were being shot by Israeli forces, that would be unacceptable. We would expect the government of Israel to investigate it, and we, if appropriate, we'd expect them to hold people fully accountable. Is the U.S. investigating it? Uh, we're, we're not conducting our own investigations. As a matter of first course, it's appropriate for the, uh, for the government of Israel to conduct investigations. We have uh, uh, intervened with them in the past about this type of incident, and they've told us they have hundreds and hundreds of ongoing investigations into potential violations of the IDF rules of conduct, and we expect them to conduct those investigations, and as I said, if they show wrongdoing, to hold people accountable. Have you told them to in conduct investigations specifically into these incidents that have occurred this week? I'm not aware of any specific con uh, contact with them about this incident per se, but this is the type of thing that we often communicate with them about, and it's the type of thing we expect them to take action on. Go ahead, let me, go ahead, and then I'll go to Michelle next. Um, you said Israel has the right to conduct these incursions. Um, can you just explain to us if this administration supports the bombing of Beirut? Uh, so when it comes to, to Hezbollah militants who are in Beirut, Israel has the right to go after the Hezbollah leadership, go after Hezbollah militants who are directing a campaign of terror against Israel and have been directing a campaign of terror against Israel for some time. Now that said, we want to see them do so in a way that minimizes civilian harm, that prevents civilian casualties, and properly takes into account the, the, the risks of going after militants who are operating in a dense urban environment. And this is part of the dis ongoing discussions you're having with them? Yes, all aspects of, of Israel's military campaign are uh, part of the discussions we were having with them. Okay, um, and I know you keep being asked this, I'm going to ask again, do you have any reason to believe that the Israelis Intent the airport. Uh, I have no reason to believe that th that they do. I will let them speak to uh, their intent, and we have made clear to them that we want to see the airport stay open, and we want to see the roads to the airport stay open. Michelle. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to go back to North Gaza uh, quickly. The World Food Program says that the, the there's been no food entering that part of um, Gaza since October 1st. Are you worried that the Israelis are laying siege on that part? We uh, are incredibly concerned about the humanitarian situation in all of Gaza and particularly concerned about the humanitarian situation in North Gaza. And I can tell you it has been the subject of some very urgent discussions between uh, our two governments. We have been making clear to the government of Israel that they have an obligation under international humanitarian law to uh, allow food and water and other needed humanitarian assistance to make it into all parts of Gaza, and we fully expect them to comply with those obligations. Michelle. Yeah. Uh, so Michelle, too. Uh, first, Israel has uh, ordered 
the residents of uh, Lebanese uh, towns uh, in the south to evacuate to the north of Awali River. Uh, it's further than it's further north than uh, the Tani River. How do you view this uh, order? So I can't speak to this order. We want to see them conduct. Uh, we want to see them limit their operations to what we have seen to date. These limited incursions. Um, I can't speak to what this order means, but certainly. Um, uh, we want to see these incursions be limited, and ultimately we want to get back to implementation of 1701, which means the government of Israel withdrawing back behind the border. And you're supporting the implementation of the UN Security Council 1701, but what about the other uh, Security Council resolution 1559? Do you support the So, fi so uh, obviously we supported the adoption of that resolution when it was passed in the, the Security Council um, and continue to support it. I will note that there have been a number of UN Security Council resolutions that have passed over the past several decades. Um, it is always the most recent one that is the, the, the most operative and the one that we look to and the inter uh, other international community looks to. But of course, we look at other uh, Security Council resolutions that were adopted with our support and are binding as well. Uh, and there were reports that the U.S. supports uh, uh, the uh, election of uh, the Lebanese Armed Forces Commander, uh, Joseph Aoun, as the next president. Is this uh, accurate? And especially that he will be retired by next January. Uh, let me be clear about this. We do not take a position one way or the other on who the next president of Lebanon should be. That is a question for the Lebanese people and no one else to decide. Thank you. Um, Matt, while you're waiting for Israel to degrade Hezbollah's military uh, capabilities, are you also looking at diplomatic ways uh, and means to convince uh, Iran to weigh in on its proxies, especially Hezbollah, uh, as well as other proxies, to stand down, basically, to give in, as the some Israeli um, media are reporting that there is a back channel talk going on. So I'm not going to speak to any specific communications, but we have long made clear to the government of Iran, uh, uh, both directly and indirectly, that they should stop funding terrorism in the region, that terrorism only adds to the instability in the region, terrorism only adds to uh, uh, the horrific levels of conflict that we've seen across the region. Now, look, Iran obviously um, uh, has decided that it is in their interest to continue to fund Hamas, to continue to fund Hezbollah, to continue to fund the Houthis, who are the uh, collectively the primary source of instability in the region. Um, and so while we send those messages to the government of Iran, we also take steps to counter the threats that these terrorist groups that Iran sponsors, funds, arms, pose to everybody in the region. Sure, the foreign minister is making the rounds in the region. I was wondering if uh, there was anything here being passed on from Washington, where wherever he's going, Saudi uh, Arabia, Qatar. I, I, I don't have any messages to speak of from, to from here. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Matt. I uh, want to go back to northern Gaza. You uh, said in your answer to Michelle that you did some urgent uh, calls with the Israeli side to allow and demand to, uh, to allow for the entry of uh, uh, humanitarian aid and all that. What were the response? Uh, I'm not going to speak to the private diplomatic conversations. I'll just make uh, uh, reiterate what I said, which is we've made very clear, as we have for some time, uh, that they need to allow humanitarian access in. And if you look at the, the full sweep of the past year, um, there have been a, no a number of moments when we had to intervene because humanitarian access was stalled for various reasons and make clear that we expected the government of Israel to push through those roadblocks, whether they be political, whether they be bureaucratic, whether they be logistic, uh, and ensure that food and water and other aid gets to <coughs> the people who need it. And that's what and we've done um, uh, in recent days as well. And regarding also the continued or maybe a revival of the uh, military operations and and fighting in northern Gaza. There is some talks in Israel that it is a revival of the general's plan, which is a, a buffer zone in northern Gaza. I know that you, you and on this podium mentioned so many times that the U.S. position is against any shrinking or occupation of of Gaza, but uh, also we know that the Israelis have the habit of testing this uh, American position and apply their own. Do you do you think that you can stop this from happening if the Israelis want to do it? Now, we are going to continue to make absolutely clear that it's not just the United States that opposes 
any occupation of Gaza, any reduction in the size in the size of Gaza, but it is the virtual unanimous opinion of the international community, and we're going to continue to make that clear to them. Simon, go ahead. Yeah. So you mentioned the, the roadblocks, whether they be bureaucratic or political. Can you detail like what what is it that's been holding up AIDS and organ health? I'm not going to get into it from here. Obviously, I'm speaking generally what you've seen over the past year, years where you've had um, members of the Israeli cabinet at times that have taken steps. For example, you had um, members of the Israeli cabinet supporting protests that blocked um, aid getting in to Karim Shalom for a, through Karim Shalom for a while. You've had bureaucratic hurdles with uh, uh, the government of Israel not always working as well as it should with the various UN agencies and sometimes logistical hurdles of the same nature. Um, our message to the government of Israel it is, is that it is important for them to surmount these hurdles and it's the bottom line that matters and that's that the people that need food and water medicine and other needs get it and just I mean it's it's pertinent that you you have made a, a, an assessment or the secretary made an assessment that Israel has not been blocking aid uh, and that was kind of based on the fact that they were making improvements since they've gone backward would you revisit that assessment. It sounds like things have gone backward from that. So what we said in when the secretary made that assessment, and if you look at the, the language inside the National Security Memorandum report, it's quite clear that this would be an ongoing assessment and that we expect progress to continue um, and that if we see a change in situation, it'll change our policy. And at the moment, for the purposes of US law, is Israel blocking the delivery of humanitarian aid? We have not made that assessment at this time, but that goes to the point that it is urgent that they correct the situation and allow humanitarian aid to get in. Sorry, go ahead. Following up on Kylie's uh, question, you know, on what is happening in Northern Gaza and the killing and all this stuff, you know, I think over the, the past 24 hours, something like 56 Palestinians were killed, according to the Ministry of Health in, in Gaza. I mean, has this become really, you know, an accepted kind of daily occurrence? You know, it's, or does it warrant, Not. or doesn't warrant some sort of a, you know an outrage or a whimper saying, you know, you should not. It's, abs this. it's absolutely not acceptable. No civilian dying in this conflict is, accept is acceptable. And it is why the United States continues to push and advocate for a ceasefire that would bring an end to this conflict. But as you've heard me say before, yes. it takes two parties to agree to a ceasefire, right. not just yeah. one. All right, but you know what we see, Israel is, is in control uh, of the area. I mean, they keep going back and so on. Yes, you know, uh, they, they have asked the hospitals to, to evacuate or to, to leave and so on. You know, it's, it, it just keeps getting repeated and, and so on. And the, obviously, you know, going to Ahmed's question on the general's plan and so on, maybe the plan is to make, uh, you know, northern Gaza a buffer zone, maybe not to allow any kind of medical care to force people out. Well, there's... 400,000 people trapped in that area. And that would be uh, absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, okay, let me ask you a couple of uh, other questions. The, the, the Secretary General of the United Nations yesterday, you know, in terms of aid, uh, he said that UNRWA, and those were his words, is indispensable, that you cannot do it without UNRWA. There's absolutely no way to distribute uh, aid without, without UNRWA. And he says that he reached out, sent a letter, to uh, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister telling him that whatever law uh, they pass, uh, you know, would would be disastrous, would be would bring about catastrophe. Do you agree with the Secretary General that UNRWA is essential for the distribution of aid? Yes. Okay. Well, that's very good. Thanks. Uh, my last question, uh, Matt, is uh, there's talk of uh, uh, an Arab that the Arab states reportedly are putting together a you know, a region-wide ceasefire or a region-wide solution that you cannot do it, you know, piecemeal, that you have to do it all uh, all together. And that, that they read out to the U.S., can you share with us, if, if there is such a plan or such a proposal, can you share so, with us some information? So there isn't such a plan or proposal to my awareness. I can, obviously can't speak to what other countries may or may not be developing on their own, which is not to say that it's happening, but certainly no one has reached out to the United States about such a proposal, and we're not in talks with any countries about such a proposal. Do you agree with the logic or the principle that you must have a you know region-wide ceasefire or resolution so, rather than, you know... So we have always wanted to see um, a ceasefire in Gaza that would get us to a, uh, uh, 
the day after the conflict and allow us to rebuild Gaza and re reconstruct Gaza and have a political path forward for the Palestinian people. We want to get to a diplomatic resolution in the north. Now, when you talk about region-wide ceasefires, look, that would require Iran to stop its support for mm -hmm. terrorist organizations. Obviously, we would welcome Iran stopping its support for ter terrorist organizations. So, Haven't seen any indication at all that that's a step they're willing to consider. In okay. fact, quite the contrary, given their record of doing it for years and years and years. All right, but the logic is, you agree with the logic that if you have a region-wide agreement or ceasefire, uh, so, it would be more enduring? So I, I cannot speak to a hypothetical proposal that I'm not even sure actually exists in reality. Well, so I, I, I I, obviously, we want to see, we would welcome the end of conflict across the region, and we would welcome peace and stability and security across the region. It's a complicated region, it has been for some time. That would require uh, a number of actors in the region to stop the actions that they have been taking, not just in the past year, but for decades. I think the Arab countries are suggesting that, you know, we should have ceasefire in Gaza and Lebanon together, and then the other becomes like, you know, a I, I, I don't know. I don't know if they are or not. I know there's a news story about it that's dif different than actual diplomatic conversations. Um, yeah, Brian, go ahead. So you said earlier uh, that Israel has a right to attack Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. I wanted to see, ask if you had seen the Israeli Prime Minister's uh, video that he put out in English to the people of Lebanon last night. He had a couple lines in there. He said. You have an opportunity to save Lebanon before it falls into the abyss of a long war that will lead to destruction and suffering like we see in Gaza. I say to you, the people of Lebanon, free your country from Hezbollah so that this war can end. That seems like a blanket threat against the civilian population. Is that terrorism? So first of all, let me say we cannot and must not see uh, the situation in Lebanon turn into anything like the situation in Gaza. Uh, that would, of course, not be acceptable. Um, and ultimately, it is the, as I said in response to an earlier question, it is up to the Lebanese people, not anybody else, to decide on who their government is. As I said in response to another question, no country in the region should dictate to the Le Lebanese people who their leaders are. Um, not Israel, not, in, not the United States, not any of the other countries in the region, and that should but, continue but to, Israel is dictating to, to that. be the case. No, they're, they're conducting uh, operations going after a terrorist organization. That's a different thing than uh, dictating what the civilian government should be. That's a question for the Lebanese people to decide. So, But if they decide against Israel's wishes, Israel is threatening Gaza-like annihilation of the people of Lebanon. And I'm making very clear that um, there should be no c kind of military action in Lebanon that looks anything like Gaza and leaves a result anything like Gaza. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, as the Iraqi government is working tirelessly to shield Iraq from the consequences of this war, uh, in the next 10 days, the Kurdistan region is going to have an election, an election that the U.S. government was so encouraging the Kurdish political parties to have it even sooner than this time. So how do you see the process of this election and the campaign process overall? So uh, elections are a vital element of the democratic process. We support all efforts to ensure they are free, fair, and transparent and occur without further disruption or delay. And we commend the active participation of civil society and the media for supporting political discourse and raising awareness around issues of importance to Iraqi Kurdistan region <coughs> residents in the lead up to these elections. And does the U.S. government monitor this election closely or will there be any U.S. agencies on the ground on the election day to monitor the process? So we are in close contact with Iraq's independent high electoral commission as well as the UN assistance mission for Iraq as they ensure that election preparation meets key milestones and staff uh, volunteers from US Mission Iraq will participate in observing the elections at polling sites across the IKR. That's something we're doing uh, in coordination with the United Nations, international ex uh, election experts and other like-minded diplomatic missions. Thank you. Matt. Thank you, Matt. I just want to clear up uh, the name of that the person I mentioned yesterday in a press meeting was, uh, you know, the UNRWA Teachers Association of Lebanon is actually Fatah Sharif uh, Abu 
Elamine, that's going to get it off the top of the okay. line and apologize for getting that name wrong. But I wanted a couple of questions no regarding need to, Israel. No need to apologize. I get things wrong up here all the time. Well, I appreciate it. In, mm -hmm. in light of October 7th, uh, Israel attack oh, memorials. Hold on. I, I, I don't think I can let that snarky I comment pass by. <laughs> well, <laughs> well thank, thank you, Matt. In light of the uh, October 7th uh, recent Israel attack memorials, how has Ambassador Deborah Lipsat, the, the Biden administration's special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism, addressed the global fa uh, false claims that Israel has been committing genocide? And why has the ambassador whose portfolio is to combat Jew hatred been silent about the most virulent uh, Jew hatred and just a quick follow up. So I think that is a misrepresentation by far and a mischaracterization of her work over the year since October 7th and her work since she assumed that position. She speaks out on a regular occasion against uh, anti-Semitism anywhere it occurs around the world. You only have to look at her public statements, her public appearances. She has been a vocal advocate against anti-Semitism. Okay, why hasn't America's ambassador, uh, you know, uh, Deborah Lipstadt to the United Nations, taken up this cause in the United Nations to call on world leaders to dispel this lie, a lie which provokes such anti-Jewish activity and policy. And often I, I hear uh, statements about referring to Israel as committing genocide. So this is an important uh, issue to address. Um, so why hasn't the America's ambassador to the United Nations taken up this cost at the United Nations to dispel this? We have spoken to it uh, at the United Nations and made clear what our position is. Yeah. Sorry. Prim. That we do not believe that no, no, Israel is... Yeah, I get that. But, but again, on the names, Deborah Lipstadt is not the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations unless something Correct. has happened thought, to LTG I, I, I thought you in first the was asking years, why so. she hasn't gone to the United Nations and, oh. and, and presented, but it you know, right. could be either. Actually, that's what I was asking was, you know, why she hasn't gone to the United Nations. Well, we years. have other uh, individuals inside the State Department who are charged with speaking before the United Nations and making clear our positions. Uh, no, most, uh, uh, as a first matter, of course, our ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas-Greenfield. She's made clear our position on numerous occasions. So you, you clearly don't believe that Israel is guilty of committing genocide, which we, we've heard from the International Criminal Court and so many others. Yeah, correct, we've made that quite clear. Thank you, Matt. Uh, a few questions. One is a question our colleagues have had trouble getting answers on is, is regarding Amos Hochstein, a, a key administration envoy to the Middle East who also in the past served in the Israeli military. There's confusion on his, his national status. Could you clarify whether he was ever a dual national or an Israeli national before and whether he gave that up? Now, I don't personally know, and it, um, uh, almost Hochstein does not work for the State Department, so any questions about him I would direct to the White House. Okay. Um, on, on another note, it's now been 120, excuse but, me. But I, I would also say it's a, I, I, well, never mind. I won't, I won't tangle with the question anymore. Go ahead. Um, it's now 254 days since Israeli forces killed him in the job. While the IDF claim, they maintain that this claim that they weren't in the area, our colleagues at Sky News said it's, quote, undeniable that they were, affirming a string of reporting that we've seen saying as much. The IDF then disputed that report and also said there's no misconduct investigation into that incident. So what's going on here? You know, it's nearly been nine months of the U.S. saying it's, it's waiting for Israel to investigate itself. At one point, Israel even reportedly lying. That's not what we said with respect to this to this particular investigation. This for, with respect to this particular incident, um, we encouraged the uh, government of Israel to work with parties on the ground that said they had information. Um, the government of Israel said to us, and it said publicly, that none of those parties came and gave them the, the information that they have said publicly. Right, and then the it's Red... A it's just a different yes. matter. thank you for clarifying. And then the Red Crescent, they claimed that Israeli forces never reached out to them on the investigation. Correct. Um, but all to say, this has been nearly nine months of this. This case is, of course, just illustrative of tens of thousands of kids killed. So how exactly is the U.S. approaching this if on this case, nine months later, th the Israel is now saying there's no investigation into this incident? And how can the U.S. keep unconditionally sending more weapons if this is how Israel is dealing with investigations of potential violations. So let's separate a couple of different things. This is, uh, uh, as I said, a little bit of a different matter than other investigations into potential violations, which the government of Israel has said that, that they are conducting. Uh, you should go to them for questions about what they may or may not be doing. And with this one where they've said, and I know the Red Crescent has said something different, we're not in a position to ultimately adjudicate um, uh, which bit of information is accurate and which is not. I can tell you what we are doing with, uh, on behalf of the United States government, which is conducting our own assessments 
of a variety of incidents that raise questions about violations of international humanitarian law, and those assessments are ongoing. Is this one of them? Uh, I'm not going to speak to individual uh, assessments. I've uh, always made clear that's not something I'm going to do. There are a number of uh, incidents that are under review and continue to be under review. So this just gets to one, I guess, broader question. The U.S. and, and yourself have noted that, of course, this is a complicated conflict, but why then has the U.S. response over this year been, I mean, in other words, just kind of binary? For example, after the IDF killed seven World Central Kitchen workers, including an American, there were, of course, calls for investigation, urgings for accountability. The department then said in NSM 20 that it couldn't reach a conclusion of whether U.S. weapons were used in that attack. Result, more weapons have been sent. After the IDF killed American Aishinor Egi, there were calls for investigation. No updates at just yesterday. Investigation that's ongoing. Right, but, but yet, uh, just yesterday, Representative Pramila Jaipal, Jaipal noted that she had sent a letter to the State Department asking for information on, on what accountability measures are being taken, whether there will be an independent investigation. She hasn't heard back, and this and is we will we will write back to her. I, I'm only intervening because, like, sometimes when there are four no, no, premises I, getting up yeah, to the question, I, 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 it's yeah. kind of hard to remember them all sure. when we get to the ultimate question. So uh, we will respond to the Congresswoman, of course. We have made clear there need, needs to be full accountability, uh, if merited, w when that investigation uh, concludes, and we'll continue to wait to see the results of the investigation. So sure. let me yes. get to the no, question, no. maybe. Yes. There's him, the job. There's all these hundreds of journalists that have been killed, medical workers, over and over again. Despite the conflict being complicated, the question is to send more weapons or not to send more weapons. There's no notion of conditioning weapons on just completing investigations, respecting human rights, let alone stopping illegal settlements or the occupation. Why is that the case? We continue to make clear that we are committed to the defense of Israel. That is a position that is not going to change. We can, they uh, are a country that are under threat from a terrorist organization uh, in Gaza, Hamas, that we saw what horrible uh, brutality they were willing to inflict on October 7th. And they continue to be under threat from a terrorist organization in the north, Hezbollah, that has launched rockets for uh, a year targeting Israeli civilians. They continue to be under threat by Iran that has launched ballistic missiles on two separate occasions at the State of Israel. So we're going to continue to come to their defense. But at the same time we come to the defense, their defense, we're going to continue to insist that they conduct their military operations in a way that minimizes civilian casualties. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, I'll come to you next time. Um, so um, are there uh, foreign countries sending uh, aid to Florida amid Hurricane Milton? Has state been in touch with countries in coordinating assistance to Florida? I'll have to take that back and, and get you an answer. OK. And we learned that you, I'm going to butcher this name. Sorry. Um, Zhu uh, XU and then X-I-A-O-L-E-I, a Chinese national and former student at the Berkeley College of Music, sentenced to nine months in prison for threatening a pro-democracy activist, went back to China as part of an exchange for an American to come back to the States. Can you confirm that? I don't have any comment on that. Um, and then what are America's red lines when it comes to, cease, to ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hezbollah and Israel and Hamas? Uh, I, uh, we have made clear we want to see a ceasefire in Gaza. I think we've made quite clear what um, the, the general outlines of that ceasefire should look like. The president made a speech about it. The, pre the secretary has spoken to it on any number of occasions. And we want to ultimately see a diplomatic but resolution. But what are the red lines specifically? Uh, I'm not going to speak to our well, diplomatic before conversation. Before we leave the, the region, I got two really brief ones on Lebanon. Uh, one, are you aware of um, the Lebanese uh, arresting a, a three-way dual national who also happens to be a, a, is a UK, Israel, and US citizen, and then deporting him? So Do you know anything about we this have seen journalist? Uh, so we have seen reports uh, on that question. I checked into it just before I came out here. Um, we're gathering information on what exactly took place at this time. OK, but so you- I don't have any, anything You don't further. know if the Lebanese ever informed you I, about I don't this. have, yeah, I don't have anything further. And then secondly, report. can you just extremely, what is the status of US assistance to the LAF? Um, I'll have to go back and check. I know that we have so we have provided assistance to the Lebanese Armed Forces over a number of years. That's been ongoing. I don't know the current assistance, but we very much support the mission that they. All right. Have. Can someone try yeah, and get a check on that? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, something you said earlier about these ongoing assessments uh, in, in response to the question about um, Hain Rajab. Can you tell us like what kind of what are these assessments? Are these under the uh, there's a Cherg process that you've mentioned before. There's obviously Leahy. Uh, wh what are we talking about with those? Uh, we have a whole variety of assessments that are underway, but I'm just not going to speak to them publicly. Okay. And you, is, is there a, 
uh, any timeline, or these can just go on indefinitely? We want to get them concluded as soon as possible. Okay. The other thing, um, just to follow up on something came up yesterday uh, with this question of the amount of money that um, the U.S. has sent to Israel uh, during the course of this conflict. Um, you said that the, the number produced by Brown University was incorrect. Do you have a number that you can give yet? Yeah, I did go back and, and um, dig into this, and the answer, I think, shows why it's such a complicated question. So um, since October 7th, we the department has provided $6.8 billion in foreign military financing to the government of Israel. That's financing that we provided them that they then used to purchase uh, U.S. weapons. $3.3 billion of that was in the memorandum of understanding between uh, our two countries that was signed somewhere around a decade ago, and that continues to be in effect. And then there was an additional $3.5 billion to the, that was included in the supplemental. So that is money that we have provided Israel, to Israel to purchase U.S. weapons. It's not the same as the amount of weapons that have, uh, Israel has actually purchased and that have been delivered in the past year, which gets to why this is a, a difficult question. So. We have approved $5 billion in actual government to government sales. Most of that $5 billion would be included, would come out of that $6.8 billion. But not all of it would be from that $6.8 billion because some of it would have been uh, money that was, a, that was provided to Israel in previous years that they had not yet spent down. Um, so that gets you to why it's a, like, why it's a, a bit of a tricky question to answer, whether you're looking at it as money that we have provided to Israel for um, uh, weapons purchases or actual uh, purchases that they have um, uh, made. And then there's another $500 million uh, that's a separate um, pot of money that the State Department doesn't uh, administer, but it's for missile defense. It's administered out of the Pentagon that is also contained in the, the memorandum of understanding that we provided as well. My uh, arithmetic's not that great. Could could you... It's probably better than mine. Could, could you just tell me <laughs> so what, what are the... Government and English the, majors. The so if you're going to ask me to do math here at the podium, I, 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 we're, we're, we're in I for mean, trouble. I, I have a sociology degree, so... <laughs> um, the, uh, but, but if you add those numbers together, all the different programs... Um, the number comes out. What, what is the number? You, you know, you're, so that, allowed, you're setting your own parameters here. So, that, um, so I mean, that, that's what I mean. It's, it, yeah. That's why it's, it depends what you're looking at. So if you take the 6.8 that we provided to them in foreign military financing, there's 6.8, and another 500 million in missile fund, that would be 7.3. But not all that money has been spent in the past year, year, right? That's money that's been provided to them. It's a different question than what has actually been delivered. Even if you look at that $5 billion that they have spent, not all of those weapons were delivered in the past year, so they spent that money. Some of those won't be delivered for years to come. Then there's the entire separate question of sales that we notify to Congress. This sometimes gets get, uh, make, uh, draws public attention. So we notify Congress of a potential sale to Israel. Congress signs off on that sale, and it gets reported that we've approved, say, $2 billion in sales. This is money that Israel does not yet have, that they expect to get under future uh, uh, tranches of money under the Memorandum of Understanding and will spend in future years. So oftentimes when you see reports about money that we have provided them for the delivery of, say, of F-16s, that's money that's not going to be spent by Israel for years and years to come. That gets why it's, I, I'm not trying to overstate it, but it's a tricky question to answer. I guess with there's been fairly various uh, U.S. government statements on, on support for Ukraine that have been able to come up with numbers yeah. right often when you're because for the purposes of trying to emphasize how much support you've given right so is that is there not just a a, no. a number that we can say all right since no. october we've uh this amount has been newly approved so that, right? that is it is an entirely fair question and the answer is because the ukraine money is on is exercised under a completely different program it's exercised under the drawdown and the drawdown we are able to, to say exactly what we're providing and how much that that money costs because that is money that is uh, equipment that is in our stocks right now and whenever we make those announcements we are able to look and see we are providing them with these specific items and they cost this amount of money it's very different than looking at an overall um, uh, relationship that is much more complex, that is much more longstanding, in which Israel exercise authority under different programs. Those are the programs I was just going through, foreign military financing being the chief most way in which we uh, provide them with support. But Matt, can you not just tell us how much of that $6.8 billion FMF over the last year has actually turned into delivered weaponry to so, Israel? So it, I, mean, I, I can't, because it gets to this question, $5 billion, first of all, 
not all the 6.8 will be spent this year, right? $5 billion has been spent by the government of Israel for these FMF, uh, FMF sales over the past uh, uh, past year. Some of that $5 billion is from the 6.8. Some of it is left over FMF from previous years. Um, some of that has been delivered in this year. But there are other things that will have been delivered that Israel would have purchased before October 7th, but the deli deliveries don't happen until later. So that's why it's a, it's a tricky question. We don't, have, we don't do an accounting based on delivery dates, right? We do an accounting based on when the government purchased something from us. And so they don't have an accounting of like, let's say there was something that they purchased in 2018 and it was delivered in March of this year. That wouldn't be contained in this number. It's part of our long-term security arrangement. And it wouldn't, you know, it's not, it's not, we don't track it that way. We track it based on the amount of money that we've provided to them in any given year. And I'm trying to give you the, the, the uh, best information I have on that. Can I just move away from the Middle East for um, something on the domestic if, front? If uh, you will let me move away from math, you can go to whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> There's also nothing wrong with sociology degrees, but anyway. Um, uh, <laughs> I um, uh, just wanted to ask about this, uh, the charges that were announced by the Department of Justice yesterday against an Afghan citizen. Uh, his name is Nasir Ahmed Toedi. Um, and uh, he's been charged for conspiring t to commit a terrorist attack on election day, US election day. Um, do you have any information about whether he came to the US as an SIV? Uh, we gather that it was after the fall of Kabul, but not necessarily related to the fall of Kabul, if there's anything you have on that. Uh, I, I don't at this time. Um, we're looking into it. I know the Department of Justice said in, in the indictment that he came uh, on an SIV. It's not clear that that's actually accurate. I know we are uh, talking to other government agencies about it. Ultimately, I would uh, refer to the Department of Homeland Security uh, uh, for that question about someone's uh, status. I would say, um, of course, and you've heard us talk about this. We've testified to Congress about it. We have extensive vetting procedures in place for the SIV program. It's a program that has wide bipartisan support because it's some, a program we use to bring to America Afghan nationals who assisted the United States military, assisted the United States government, sometimes at great personal peril and great personal risk the, uh, during the years that we are in Afghanistan. It's been an incredibly successful program. Now, that said, um, when it comes to uh, th threats against the homeland, there of course continues to be a threat against, uh, a terrorist threat against the United States. We've seen terrorist threats uh, from immigrants and we've also seen terrorist threats over the years from American citizens. And when it comes to a terrorist threat by anyone, we, uh, uh, the United States, through our intelligence community and our law enforcement community, takes those incredibly seriously. We monitor them. We're dis we disrupt them, as you saw the FBI do with this plot that was announced yesterday. And with that, we'll wrap for today. Thanks. We'll wrap for today. Thanks, everyone.